All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the June 2020 edition of the OpenZFS Developer Summit. Um, we have a, a few good things on the agenda today, uh, and we may, fingers crossed, have some extra time uh, for additional topics uh, towards the end. Um, so let me start with the uh, Developer Summit. So uh, we're announcing the OpenZFS Developer Summit uh, today. I just sent out an email to the mailing list, uh, which you'll probably see after the meeting. Um, so uh, hopefully, in, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, the conference is not going to be in person this year um, due to coronavirus concerns. Uh, so it'll be uh, online, um, like a lot of other conferences that you may have seen. Um, it's going to be in September, uh, towards the end of September, the 29th and 30th. Um, so uh, today, uh, registration is open. Uh, registration is going to be free this year. Uh, since we don't have really any um, per attendee costs that we know of yet, <laughs> at least, um, since we, you know we won't be providing food and stuff like that. Uh, so the conference is going to be free. It's going to be online, um, and uh, we uh, we'll still have registration. The registration uh, is mainly so that you can um, get notified. We'll you know we'll send an email blast to remind folks about it, um, and also for us to track who's attending. Um, you know, you'll get uh, folks who register to attend will get invites to the Slack channel and stuff like that. Um, but more importantly for today and for the folks who are on this call, uh, we uh, are calling for presentations. So uh, if you have done interesting work with ZFS in the past year, which I suspect a lot of the folks in this call have, uh, we would love to hear about it at the conference. Um, or, uh, you know, if you have an interesting experience to share using ZFS, uh, integrating with other systems, um, then uh, we'd love to hear about that stuff as well. Uh, and um, we will uh, we'll work with you to help you record the talks uh, beforehand. And then um, during the the day of the conference, uh, you know we'll have a live stream where we'll play the recorded talks and then we'll have the um, presenters and others uh, on like a live chat. Uh, so that uh, people can ask questions and get them answered. Um, we're still kind of working out the details of the technology that we'll use for that um, and kind of seeing what other conferences have done. Um, but we've seen some things that worked pretty well uh, in terms of combining uh, like uh, live spoken, um, you know, video audio uh, with um, text uh, for getting questions from, from the audience. Um, so uh, I think we'll be able to work out something that'll work pretty well. Um, and uh, one of the things that we would really like to do is to try and replicate the like hallway interaction feel um, that we have in person. Because I know a lot of the value of the conference is, uh, you know, the talks are great. We get a lot of info from the talks. That's like disseminating information. But it's really great to like see other people who are working on things, be able to have those um, serendipitous uh, interactions or like overhear somebody talking about something that you're interested in and then be able to come up and listen in and, and, uh, and get more information about something that you might not have known that you, uh, you know, that other people were working on or that other people were thinking about the same way you are. So um, we'd like to figure out how to do that uh, and we're still kind of working on that. Um, but if, if you have seen other things that work well at other conferences, um, let us know, uh, and, and we'll investigate all the all the kind of different technologies and and modes that we have for doing that. Um, yeah, so there'll, there'll be time set aside for Q and A after each talk, and there'll also be time set aside for kind of hallway, quote unquote, um, casual conversations. Um, and we'll try to have some way of splitting it up so that it's not like a hundred people trying to talk all in the same IRC channel. Um, uh, Did Matt go bye bye? Seems, Seems like that way. Yeah, I just lost him. Or he's seen a Medusa. <laughs> I always just assume it's my home internet. Well, in this case, it's not because you're working. Yeah, yeah I saw. I was like, so the timing is just really ironic. And then Alan <laughs> le leant forward, and then it was clear that it was Matt. 
Okay, how long was I talking uh, into the void there? Hi, Matt. You were, a, you were a statue for about at least 30 seconds. Oh, no. Did you, um, <laughs> could you also not hear me? I think the Correct. last thing I remember hearing is like, uh, 100 not, people in IRC. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, yep. good. Well, I didn't say too much after that. <laughs> Sorry. I, I don't know what happened there. Um, maybe my internet cut out or something. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, we'd like to find some kind of technology that's not just like 100 people talking in the same channel in IRC, um, but something where we can have like kind of breakout rooms and uh, you can go find out what people are talking about in different rooms. Um, so uh, just to reiterate, uh, we are looking for uh, folks to give talks um, about what they've been working on with ZFS or what they've discovered about ZFS or, uh, you know, how ZFS works. Uh, people really love those kind of deep dives on like, you know, how does the ARC work? How does uh, the ZIO pipeline work? Because um, those are really helpful to uh, both people new to, new to ZFS development, people who are just using ZFS, uh, as well as people who are more experienced but um, might not know the nitty gritty of like that particular subsystem. Um, so uh, the, um, the website is live. Um, we'd like to let me know by July 20th um, if you're interested in giving a talk. Um, so you have about a month to think about it. Um, and then the conference will be at the end of September. Questions about the call for presentations or the format uh, or anything else? Oh, we'll also have a hackathon. Um, that'll be like a, a, you know, virtual hackathon that we'll try to arrange and then um, have kind of ad hoc presentations at the end of it uh, online as well on the second day. Questions, comments. Uh, we we um, we will. Uh, the conference uh, does not cost us nothing to put on, uh, despite being online. So uh, there are still um, sponsorship opportunities for this year. Um, so if if your companies are interested in sponsoring, we would love to work with you. Um, and uh, one of the things that we would uh, like to do, we we um, we kind of started thinking about this last year, um, but one of the things that we'd like to do is be able to build up a bit of a, a, a buffer of funds so that we aren't starting every year. Um, that would allow us to you know, be more confident about um, you know, making monetary commitments to venues and stuff like that before all of the sponsorships for that year have landed. Um, so uh, if, you know, if your company does have the um, opportunity to sponsor, it would really help to set us up for continued success you know, in the years to come, not just this year. Um, uh, we'd love to have that financial stability. And then um, we would also, uh, one of our goals um, at, as the organization is to increase our revenues uh, a little bit so that we're able to um, uh, expand some of the things that we spend money on be, besides just the conference. Um, so ideally we'd like to be able to um, sponsor people to um, come and give talks at the conference in person um, when it's in person in future years uh, who wouldn't otherwise be able to. So like people like students that don't have companies that are gonna pay for their travel. Um, uh, and also uh, we wanna, we'd like to have the money to cover some smaller um, uh, uh, items that would be useful for development. So for example, um, test machines or, um, you, know, uh, host, uh, you know, hosting for um, developers who are like independent or, um, you know, that where their equipment isn't, isn't covered by their employers. So uh, right now we don't really have, you know, the, the ongoing revenue to be able to do that, but, um, you know, if we get a lot of, if we get kind of sponsorships at the same levels that we've had past years, then um, we'll, we'll be able to have that money in the bank to be able to do that uh, for, for the next several years. Cool. Any questions about that? Clearly you need a Patreon. <laughs> well, I mean, we're, uh, you know, we're open to using new kinds of uh, sponsorship stuff. Uh, I know that GitHub has some kind of um, sponsorship mechanism that I haven't really looked into. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'm not that familiar with Patreon. I know it's used by a lot of artists. Um, and, 
I, I don't know if that was, if that proposal was made uh, in jest or not, but uh, that was you know, we slightly are... sarcastic. Okay. I can, well, I, in all seriousness, I could see um, paying some amount of money for various levels of access, uh, yeah. or just to pay um, uh, as part of being the leadership team. Yeah, um, we have to figure out the right balance of, yeah. um, you know, because this is an open source project and we want it to be accessible to as many people as possible. So, you know, um, we we don't want to we, we don't want to go very far into the like pay to play kind of line or like pay you know pay for special considerations or special access. Um, you know. Uh, we don't want it to be the kind of thing where you know you have to give money in order to get your stuff considered, and um, you know that hasn't been the case uh, at all in the past. So um, we would we would want to be pretty careful about that, um, but definitely uh, a way for people to kind of show their support. Um, and if there is some kind of you know exclusive stuff that we could give people, maybe some exclusive pieces of swag or you know special call to chit chat with the um, you, you know, with the lead developers or something like that. Um, those kinds of things are probably on the table. Yeah. Do, do most people, are most people aware of the, of the software and the public interest thing that you have set up? Yeah, I should probably mention that. So um, for folks who don't know, OpenZFS is part of um, Software in the Public Interest, SPI, which is a um, like financial sponsor. So they handle all of our finances. Um, they're a 501c3 tax um, tax advantaged organization in the United States. Um, so, uh, and, and we accept donations uh, from the public. Um, there's like a, a, a link on our webpage that goes to a PayPal donation um, that goes to us through them. So you know, people, people can go and do that and they do, um, not to a very large degree, but uh, we could definitely work on kind of expanding that if we had, um, you know, if we thought that that would work. Um, so far, we've been pretty successful with getting the larger annual corporate sponsorships, um, which also, you know, go through SPI. Um, yeah, is, is that kind of what you were thinking of in terms of SPI? Well, yes, I, I didn't know how many people actually knew that they could just go donate if they wanted. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, we, you know, donations of all sizes are, are welcome and, and appreciated and helpful. Um, the I, I do kind of like the idea of ongoing, um, you know, sponsorships, which which is kind of the Patreon model, um, as opposed to like what we have now, where it's like, yeah, you can go out there and click a button and give us X dollars if it's a one-time deal. Um, it also isn't set up very well for us to get a lot of info about like contact details and who gave donations of how much, and then, you know, we don't like get a we don't have a huge email list of like here's all the people that donated and we blast out to ask them for more money every week the way a lot of you know a lot of um, charities do which you know i don't think that we want to run that way all right um i'll move on to the next uh topic which is a much which is much more technical topics uh, unless there are further questions about the conference or finances okay um so the the first Technical topic that we have here is a block reference table for file cloning. Um, Powell, are you on? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me, guys? Yep. OK. Uh, so uh, mm, I've been uh, pondering this idea, which is uh, not new. But uh, many people think that uh, it's uh, it should be pretty easy implemented for ZFS and it just feels uh, that ZFS should support something like this. And uh, uh, this functionality you may know from Linux, uh, there is a, a reflink switch for a copy, or there is a, a clone file uh, system call on macOS. The idea is basically that uh, you create a clone of a file, uh, which is maybe uh, if you if you need to compare it to something you can think about like hard links with copy on write properties and different inodes or like per file zfs clone 
So basically you copy file aside and uh, uh, the blocks are not physically moved to another place. So the data blocks stay where they are. You don't even have to read them. You just increase reference counters on the blocks and, uh, and basically uh, when you have to modify them, we'll create another uh, block in another place, just uh, business as usual for ZFS. So we'll just create new block. So we will just modify it this specific block. So uh, there are some, a few interesting use cases for, for this functionality. Uh, of course, a large file cloning is, is, is an obvious one. Uh, you can easily clone uh, like VM images or large files like this, and uh, it should it should be very fast operation and take almost no additional space. You you still have to pay for the indir indirect blocks, uh, but that's of course uh, much much lower cost than actual data blocks. Another interesting use case is being able to recover. Uh, files from snapshots without paying price for additional space. So if you remove the file currently and the file is still in your snapshot, you can copy the file back to your data set, but, but it will occupy new space. Uh, this functionality should also allow us to move files between data sets. So that would be nice as well. Uh, and possibly, but that's uh, not sure how that would be uh, interesting, but uh, potentially you could create, for example, you could move blocks uh, in files in files around. So for example, you could create a hole in a file at the beginning of the file just by moving the blocks around without actually paying for the for the space. Uh, mostly paying for the space in snapshots, right? Because uh, if the data set, data set is not snapshot, you could copy the file and reorganize the blocks, but of course it will take much longer and, uh, and you, we don't really want to do that. But of course this uh, creating holes in files, that's limited for uh, record size uh, ranges. So you cannot create a hole, you, would, you wouldn't be able to create a hole of 10 bytes or something like that. Uh, so the first idea, of course, that comes to mind is uh, reusing uh, ddup for that. And you could reuse ddup uh, if you have ddup enabled. Uh, it is possible to create a shortcut that basically you just read the, uh, the checksums uh, from block pointers uh, and uh, clone those checksums, create new block pointers with the same checksums and create uh, DDT entries for them. So that, that is possible, but of course uh, we want this to work without dedupe. But... Uh, mm, without so, dedupe meaning um, without having to turn on dedupe beforehand and, yes. and also without the performance overheads of dedupe? Uh, the, those are two separate subjects, <laughs> but um, I, I'm teeing but, you up. I hope. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yes. Yeah, so for the first one, yes, we don't want uh, uh, ddup to be enabled uh, for this functionality to work. Uh, mm, I would love this to be just always enabled, uh, but I will. Uh, uh, get back to that in a bit. And of course, we don't want this to be another uh, dedupe. So, but the problem is of course that uh, uh, if we have a data block on the disk and we have a block pointer pointing at this block, we cannot uh, have like a reference counter in this block pointer because of course we cannot, ref uh, we cannot modify a uh, block pointer. So uh, my idea was to create something similar to ddupe, uh, but uh, uh, bear with me before, <laughs> before uh, you start not to like the idea. Uh, 
so what uh, what's the difference between this and ddup so uh, with ddup every write every block that we write goes to ddup table so one of the problems and the large cost of ddup you cannot have this always enabled right because every single write creates an entry in ddup table uh, and, the, and a big part of the cost of ddup is things with ref count equals one exactly right yeah. at least that's kind of the premise of i think a lot of where you're going is that yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff with the ref count equals one kind of dominates the ddup table and all the you know storage costs and io costs associated with it yeah so uh one of the ideas you could think about uh, uh and i'm sure it was discussed to optimize ddup was to remove uh entries that, uh, with ref count one that are older than something but of course it's always some other maybe there will be another entry and uh, you could reuse it somewhere in the future so uh, but going back to to this block reference table so so yes yeah, so ddup uh, the cost of ddup is for every single block you write even if the ref co reference counter is equals to one we have to pay the price another problem is that uh, we have in ddup table we have checksum so we cannot really sort properly so the the ddup entries are scattered through the whole ddup table and uh, we have to pick and choose uh, what we when we uh, write and uh, and we can reference uh, uh, ddup entry so uh but uh, uh so with block reference uh, table uh you only create entries uh, when the reference counter is uh, uh, greater than one. So you have your uh, block of data, you have a block pointer pointing to the data, right? And we cannot modify that. But once you call this clone file system core or whatever we want to call that, uh, we will read existing block pointers. Uh, we will create new block pointers just copying the the data from the original block pointers, uh, storing them in new file and creating entries in this uh, block reference table. So uh, the entry is only created when the block is actually cloned. So if you don't use this functionality, there is no price to pay. There is also no price to pay when you read, there is no price to pay when you write, but there is price to pay when you free the block. So uh, when you free the block, we cannot really tell uh, if the block was, uh, has more than one reference. So uh, for every single free, we have to consult uh, the table. Uh, so uh, in ddup, it's different because, uh, because every single write goes to ddup table uh, every single block pointer that points to a block which is in the ddup table has this dbit set. So uh, if there is no dbit set, uh, we don't have to console ddup table when we free the block. Uh, here, because we want this functionality to be always on, on every free we have to console the table. Uh, so that's one of the biggest concerns uh, performance wise uh, because of course this table if we clone a lot this table can grow let's say a lot uh, but of course if we clone the same block there is still one entry we just increase the reference count uh, but of course it is potentially a problem uh, the uh, the entry uh, on disk is really is very very small uh, in memory is much smaller than ddup. The ddup entry currently is uh, 392 bytes. Uh, block pointer, uh, block reference uh, table entry at this point is 80 bytes, but I think it could be a bit smaller. Uh, and uh, another, uh, another optimized, well, another uh, fortunate uh, properties that uh, we actually uh, can sort those entries because uh, we reference VDEF and offset. So we can actually 
sort those, those entries on disk. So if we want to clone a file, it is likely that all the entries are nearby. So we may get all the entries by just doing single read. Yeah, so the, the block reference table is basically a mapping from the um, VDEV and offset to the rough count. Yeah. Right. Anyway. So like you could you could put them in a hash table if you wanted to, but you could do much better um, for locality by putting them in a sorted data structure that's sorted by the VDEV and offset. Exactly. Those are just exactly three properties we need to store physically on the disk. It's VDEV ID, offset, and reference counter. That's it. Because uh, we do uh, we do have original block pointer when we when we clone the block. So, uh, so for example, copying the ID or uh, trying not to pay the price on every single uh, free, one of the ideas would be to, to have a toggle on the data set that this data set supports uh, block referencing. This would allow us to put, let's say, uh, R bit into the block pointer. Uh, which tells that this block was created in data set that supports uh, block references. And then on the free, we check if the, this bit is set. If it is, then we then, then and only then we consult the block reference table. But of course, could you, not on, without... Could you do that easier using the per data set feature flag thing like we do for, you know, this data set has born some block that used SHA-512 or, or whatever? so that you wouldn't have to even do it in every block pointer? Just this data set has used reflink, so every free from this data set has to uh, consult the table? Yes, I believe we, we could do that. Um, I guess we'd have to make sure we set the flag on both if you're using it to copy blocks from one yeah, data set yeah, to another, but. Definitely. Basically, it means that uh, this, Whenever we clone uh, the block to the source or destination data set, we, we have to mark it as contaminated, let's say. <laughs> and then uh, from now on just, uh, well, we could, well, I would like to discuss possible optimization because that's the uh, Matt's biggest concern, but uh, let me just uh, finish uh, uh, because uh, something that I didn't expect it and I, uh, uh, it didn't uh, like it wasn't obvious initially for me, but there is no way this could survive ZFS send and receive. So uh, with with ddup, we we send the block, uh, we uh, we recalculate the checksum, and ddup will uh, handle uh, the reference for us. In this case, we have no idea if if the block is already there uh, in the destination data set. So. We cannot really, uh, we cannot really uh, make this work through ZFS send and receive. Uh, yeah. So the yeah, other side, however, is that this is essentially manual deduplication, and a post-processing pass would fix that. So I don't consider that a big issue. Yeah, that's another way to put it. Is just it. It could be used as a manual uh, duplication, <clears throat> so you could even do passes regularly through your data and just do that. Um, if if you restricted it to um, references within one data set, would that allow you to send it over send and receive more easily? Well, because it's indexed on the DVA and that doesn't translate to the other side. Right. Probably not. Like you would have to yeah, I guess that you do the references the at like the object level. Find right? the, you couldn't find I have a block that I know is in a table, but I don't know where the other one is that references it. So you wouldn't know how to tell the other side what to do. Yeah. Okay. The only the only way. Yeah. I guess you could. It does, it does seem not great to have to require this like post processing, which would be very expensive, right? Because the post processing would be basically like generate a DDoP table of all the stuff that you like think might have point like data in common, and then um, 
you know, when right. you find something in the, with Rakuten. Or you, two, use the, or you can two. use the checksums that are already on the blocks as you're setting them. The receive process can do this optionally. It could be a very large table, but it would be user side. Yeah, but it's still, uh, I mean. You need the table from inside the pool, said. though, as no. well as the table from in the no. stream. Not really. Only if you want to, uh, sorry. You can do this by uh, any new blocks in the send would be, uh, can be manually uh, deduped as part of the receive process. Tying it to any existing block requires, a prior block, block requires another pass. That is true. Yeah, right, sure. Oh, that's kind of how um, the uh, like redupe yes. uh, functionality that I added to process dedupe streams works, right? Like yeah. when, when you receive so, the stream, you generate a big table in, uh, in the user's process and then figure out what is the same as other things. See? Well, I think so proof this of would, concept. This would just work. I think this would just work uh, uh, within a single ZFS stream. It should work, uh, I believe. Uh, that uh, we could make that work, yeah. but, uh, but to get the full function, you know, yeah. But to get kind of the full functionality, because you know, you're saying that you want to be able to use it not just for like within one file system cloning files, but like cloning files across file systems, or you know, after the fact, dedupe where we go and find and anything anywhere in the storage pool that's the same as anything else, and then you know, basically add those to the block reference table. Um, to do that, to get a similar result on the receiving system you would have to do this big, you know, global post processing, right? Like I could have done a write as per this receive, which has the same contents as something in some other file system right. that seems to be unrelated. So you'd have to go like, look at everything, the whole, like go read all the block pointers in the whole pool and put them into a giant table. So this, though I understand that in, the, in happy weather, the table will be smaller than the DDT. I'm assuming that if you did this, you would end up with essentially the full, uh, something the full size of a DDT on a large system. No, sorry, no. The, rolling back to just 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 the feature, the the the, the yeah, BR. no, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, right, yeah. I mean, in the limit, it feels like it would degrade to the same size. I think conceivably, depending on yeah, if everything had ref count of, of more than one. But yeah. the um, what I recall. Well, issues with the DDT model were things like how do you figure out how much of it to keep in memory versus remain resident on the disk managing the the flow between those two tiers of storage for the thing like so is the plan what's the plan with with that management and um what is going to be the failure mode in the case that it doesn't fit in ram I guess. Yeah, I agree. I think that we should, given that, um, given the performance implications of saying that every every free, maybe within that data set or whatever, but like a lot of the frees are going to have to go look up in this table. On, um, on disk, conceivably. Yeah, so uh, I think that we should try to aim for a model where this table is in memory. Um, and kind of design with that as the design point. Um, and maybe we, that's, we design to be in free. Hi, Matt. We, Matt, you're doing but, the, you're doing the you robot memory, thing again, Matt. Move to the pool to a smaller memory system, then there's some fallback. Can you guys still hear me or am I coming to cutting no, out? We can, yeah, yeah. Now, we, you're back now. Okay. Um, I thought it was me. Sorry, uh, I guess I'll have to work on my internet. Um, the I, the point I was trying to make is that I think that we would serve ourselves well by designing this around being in memory um, as kind of the normal mode of operation because this will decrease the uh, performance impact of those freeze where we have to look up in it. I think that the thing that terrifies me is that with the way that it sounds like 
if you experience a problem now, like if you get yourself into the state where it doesn't fit in memory anymore and now you have to spill the disk, that you would think, okay, well, it's okay. I'll just clean it up and turn it off. But like with Dedupe, the cleanup then in the failure mode is extremely expensive and takes possibly forever and probably affects pool operation. Like that's the the worrying thing is that you, you cross this Rubicon that you don't know exists necessarily and then it's very hard to get back. And, and yeah. I, like, I don't currently work. So we should work design it so a... that it's hard to cross that, right? Like, right. I mean, just to throw out some kind of uh, probably not or impossible, good, but... actually. Yeah. yeah. Well, so like a very like, basic yeah. idea would be like, you can't use more than 10% of your rent. Like we're going to use, we're going to put it in, in rent. You can't use more of your if 10%, you stop adding entries. Right. Yeah, but you're like going to deal with system, kind of default. You're going to deal with systems that have dynamic amounts of RAM in them. So just because the system was booted with 64 gigs of RAM and you wrote a certain pool, doesn't mean that they don't turn the VM down to 32 gigs or set it to 96 or, and you know, you'll be just a yeah. sideways. I agree. Those are issues. And, and certainly dedupe cost me many sleepless nights where it would seemingly work okay while the system was running and then you'd reboot it and everything would go sideways. I'm not currently working at a public cloud provider, but I, uh, in my previous public cloud provider hat, we would absolutely have turned this off. Well, from Alan and I have some experience with this sort of limitation now. Yeah, you know, building it with a quota to start with doesn't seem like a bad idea. Um, the advantage this has is that if the on disk structure is more sorted, it'll be a little easier to load the range you're trying to free rather than uh, you know each free being a random read. Uh, from somewhere in the data structure. That, that's and only also, true if things are nearby though, right? Like, right, yeah. Um, yeah. And I also wondered if it made sense to store the the table for each VDEV as a separate object so that you only have to load the one for the VDEV you're actually looking at. But I guess if they're but sorted, you're not going to be looking at all of them. Yeah. Right, like yeah. Oh, files are free is going to spread, out spread across VDEVs. everything. So on a general system, how many more, how, what is the ratio of freeze to writes? Uh, in the limit, it's one to one. Yeah. Well, but on the general system, since you, we typically have a bunch of snapshots and clones, that means things aren't being freed for every write necessarily. Yeah, well, but in, your, the, uh, in the limit, like once, once, like once your pool reaches a steady state of percent full, and you then um, like as, as much bytes as you write, you must also free, like by okay. definition. If like, you that's the definition that's of steady state. Snapshot. Uh, if you've got snapshots, you're gonna have to age them out eventually. I mean, mm -hmm. and at the point that it comes time to do that, it's gonna be expensive, and it's probably gonna be surprised. And probably pretty random, uh, since what blocks of the snapshots free is kind of scattered. Would it be possible to uh, gate this? I think that one advantage of special command putting the cost so on the freeze. What? Would it be possible to gate this functionality under a special command as opposed to just a generic copy, like file system copy? Well, so yes, uh, you could do it. Uh, the, the, the primary use in this, uh, in Paul's case is um, CP dash dash reflink. Uh, but I would prefer to be able to use it in a more generic sense. Because um, as I said, this does lend well to a offline dedupe uh, process. What kind of API would you expect that? To, to have like for the offline dedupe case i'm sorry you're breaking up where i am no oh, sorry um what about now uh oh goodness all right never mind 
But also for the cost. Question. Yeah. Pavel? Uh, so I didn't get any questions, <laughs> if, if there was one. But uh, as for the cost, like in memory, because that's, of course, our big, biggest concern. So uh, uh, when you compare it to DDoP, uh, the entry is much, it's uh, like five times smaller. But if you think about that, it's uh, it's even uh, uh, two times smaller when you go further because the worst case scenario for this is that every single block in the pool is referenced twice. Right? That that's the worst case scenario. In dedupe, the worst case scenario is that every single block is referenced once. So by definition. This table, even if the entry would take the same amount of space uh, as dedupe entry, the table would be half of the dedupe table already, right? Because you cannot reference the block once to, to get into this table. So, uh, so at this point, uh, so with this in mind, the entry, the in-memory cost is uh, around 10 times lower than dedupe. It is still a cost. I'm not denying that, and uh, uh, and I recognize that you can get like past the point. Well, of course, you are more aware what you are doing. Like in dedupe, the blocks are written, and and you have no idea that the table is growing. Uh, here, you are more. This is more conscious process that uh, you you clone the file. So. Uh, uh, but but it's still like you don't expect the cost on free. This is this is not intuitive. Uh, but also uh, like moving files between uh, data sets. That's that's practically free, because when you move blocks between data sets, you only create those entries temporarily, and you free them once you move the file. So if you don't clone a file but just move between data sets, that's free. But that's of course a small win. We want to address the, uh, the bigger problem. Oh, sorry, I cut out there. Um, I, I think that uh, we have about 15 minutes left. Maybe we should leave this uh, by yeah. just mentioning that the at a high level, um, I mean, I think that this is really cool. Uh, it, uh, you know, it enables some, some neat functionality with hopefully much better performance than dedupe, but I think that we need to think really hard about how uh, how the table is managed and how we're going to get good performance uh, and not have uh, unpredictable performance, um, and how we're going to manage like the transition between in memory and on disk, uh, having a table be in memory and on disk. Okay, thank you, guys. Um, so I, hopefully we have time to cover uh, a few of these additional topics. Um, next on the agenda, we have Alan uh, with the next boot feature. Right, so um, when Andre Grupal originally created the kind of next boot feature, uh, he named it next boot, uh, but that actually conflicts with the name of uh, an existing feature in FreeBSD, uh, which is mostly a loader feature that lets you choose a different kernel or, or something rather than a data set. Uh, so we would like to change the name to boot once because uh, we'll also be adding support for next boot. Uh, and it would be confusing to call the one that's always been called next boot something different. Um, that changes one act that I think is only implemented on FreeBSD. So I was just wanted to see if anybody had an objection before I proposed doing that. So the, the specifically, it's changing the IACTL name. Yes, yeah, so we're changing. Uh, well, I think there's a function as well, or whatever. But yes, the the libzfs and the um, the IACTL from uh, next boot to boot once, uh, and so that we can add the new one. I'll have to look a little more closely and, and make a proposal. But I just wanted. Yeah. To... All right. Yeah, go ahead and open to PR, and I think we can um, probably now hammer out any details uh, okay. in in the review. Thank you. In FreeBSD, we also use boot once in GPT boot uh, for yes. what you are yes. proposing, so that would also match. Yeah, exactly. 
Okay, the real question is anyone other than FreeBSD using it? I think in the OpenZ of repo, it's if def FreeBSD, so. <laughs> I don't think there's a problem. <laughs> cool. Um, any other questions on this? All right, cool. Then uh, the next topic we have is alias system properties. Sean? So about a year ago, the topic came up of how to deal with uh, system properties that are actually OS specific um, and share NFS was one that was, uh, was given uh, the other very share types. The example I use is mount options because that's my particular passion. Uh, I created a PR and other than some nits about which characters to use haven't gotten much feedback. Is this still something people care about? Yeah, I think so. Um, I know uh, George Wilson had looked at this a bunch in the past as well. I don't see him on the call, um, but you, you might reach out to him uh, directly. Uh, I will Slack. do so again, but uh, he last call he said he would he would look at it and he did. Yeah, yeah, we we've been a little bit busy over here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, so my uh, my frame of reference is if if somebody said that they were going to do something, then I don't feel bad about bugging them once a week. Um, so okay. if I've if I've said that I would do something for you, then please don't feel bad about bugging me, you know, reminding me once a week. Um, yeah, I, maybe hopefully other people feel similar, similarly. So um, I know, especially stuff today. that's kind of volunteer effort, um, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't necessarily come to the top of mind um, when, when it should or when it could. So I think, you know, kind of weekly reminders or check-ins um, you know, it can be really lightweight. Just send them a message on Slack, send them an email or, or send, you know, send me a yeah. message. I'll do that today. Okay, but if anyone else has thoughts about it, please feel free to let me know. Cool. Um, the last thing that I had was uh, something from last week. This will hopefully also be short, but the uh, send capital L large files um, bug. Uh, so uh, I think we meant to talk about this last month. The fix has since been integrated. Um, for folks who aren't familiar, um, you can read more about it in the pull request. Uh, but there was a bug where um, basically if you, uh, if you have a file system that has blocks more than 128k, so you've changed the record size property to be more than 128k, then <clears throat> When you send those, really, you probably should have always been using send capital L to send those large blocks. If you don't use capital L, then the send tries to split the large block into smaller blocks, which was kind of a bad idea uh, that I implemented back in the day. Um, and uh, this resulted in a bug where if you are using send uh, and you have large blocks and you switch between sending with capital L and non-capital L. So you switch between actually transmitting the large blocks and splitting up the large blocks or vice versa, then um, you could get the wrong contents on the target. Um, so it would incorrectly zero out that file's contents. Um, this applies like if you're updating the file incrementally. So like, you know, you have an existing file and then you're changing some part of it, uh, then it could zero out the other contents of it. So um, the fix, uh, the main um, the main thing that people need to be aware of is that um, now if you are switching from sending large blocks with capital L to not sending large blocks with without capital L, then uh, the the receive is going to fail. Um, so rather than giving you like the wrong data on the receiving system, it's just going to say nope, you can't do that. Um, if you set if you switch from not using capital L to using capital L then the uh, receiving system will now handle that correctly, um, preserving the smaller block size of the already received files. Um, and uh, So it'll break them up. Yeah, yeah. So um, why not just get rid of the flag and always have its behavior? 
Well, that is a great question. <laughs> um, so the, the reason that we don't want to do that uh, is because um, that could exacerbate the problem for existing uh, systems. So like if all along you've not been using the flag and then all of a sudden we make the default be to use the flag, then we put you, we kind of put you directly into this case where you're going to hit the bug. Now, if the receiving system has been upgraded, then it'll, it, then it'll know how to do this and it'll handle it properly. But if you upgrade the sending system, but you don't upgrade the receiving system, then basically we automatically triggered this horrible bug for you. So we don't want to do that. Um, but uh, I, um, I kind of paved the road to being able to make the capital L be the default or only um, case uh, by um, adding a new send stream format flag. Um, and basically this will allow us to say that um, when, we, when we do switch to the, this new default, you can only receive those streams on newer systems. So, you know, at some point, you know, next year, a couple of years from now or whatever, depending on releases, um, we can change the default to be to send the large blocks um, and uh, there'll be some rule about like, well, that's the default, but you're not going to be able to receive those on those, you know, ancient systems from, you know, pre-2020. Um, but it will detect that correctly. The receive will give you a message um, and then, uh, you know, you can, you know, you'll be able to say, dash, dash, split up the blocks to small blocks or whatever um, to go back to the old behavior. So yes, I, I agree with your sentiment. I would love to get to that world where that's the default. I wish that I had just uh, done that from day one, um, but I think that this change uh, will let us get to there once we, um, once we can be confident that we aren't going to be inconveniencing a huge number of uh, users by Either making, either triggering the bug for them, or um, making their receives that used to work fail. So at some point we will decide that the default ZFS send isn't compatible back to you know V15 or whatever. Uh, yeah. Right now it still that's, is, right? Yeah, that's the idea. Is that um, you know today, and, and this is kind of why I did this functionality to begin with was uh, like if you just use ZFS send, you don't give you any options it's giving you like the base uh, type of sensory format that can be received on the widest variety of systems. Um, and uh, the idea is that, yeah, in the future we would change that so that the base ZFS send without any flags would only, uh, if you are using large blocks, then it would only be receivable by systems that have this commit that I just added two weeks ago. Right, but like, do we want to consider maybe doing that with embedded block pointers and some of the other features? Uh, or maybe, you know, opt yeah. into switching them off rather than defaulting to them off? Yeah, I mean, we could definitely do that. Those things are much more straightforward. I mean, we could do right. that. We could look at that today because like turning on embedded block pointers or compressed sends or whatever, um, those are like, if you do that, then the receiving system ha always has re um, correctly detected that it can do that or not do that. Right. right. So it's not going to trigger any horrible bugs either way. It's just a matter of um, like you won't be able to receive it on systems older than whatever, 2015. Right. Um, so yeah, we can consider that now kind of orthogonally to this. Um, uh, we, you know, we probably kind of misdesigned this uh, or we, we did not have an eye to future enhancements. And I think that, you know, ideally we probably should have made it so that the send um, uses all the features by default. And then like you can opt down to some, to whatever your receiving system is gonna have. Um, kind of similar to what we've discussed with like the pool format with the like compatible on disk feature flags equals 2019 or whatever. Um, yeah. There we, de we default the other way, we default to having everything enabled, but um, having some way of specifying, like, I want it to be down revved to this, you know, le level of compatibility um, would make a lot of sense. And yeah, I wish we had done that 20 years ago, but uh, hopefully we will get to it one of these years. It's definitely been 
helpful during the transition, like when we went from V15 up to V28 and, and the beginning of feature flags and stuff, it was definitely helpful the fact that it didn't default to doing that. In particular, like the, the script that manages the replication doesn't have to try to specify a, you know, the backwards compatible flag that the older system doesn't know exists or something at the same time. You know what I mean? Like if you're thinking of the replication tool like ZREPL or something that's, uh, or maybe a simpler one like, um, ZX for where it's going to call the ZFS command line if it has to figure out, is your version new enough to know about this new backwards compatible flag, then that can get uh, Well, kind of I mean, if you're writing one of those tools, then presumably you would be smart enough to think about this and, and, and say like dash dash minimum features, you know, right. it, to get the behavior that we have today or say, you know, dash dash compatible version equals 2010. Like, I don't really care about people receiving this on systems from before to that, for, that are more than right. a decade old, right? Um, so giving people the option of those kinds of things is what I would like to see. And then we can we can bike shed the default to death. Like right. well, once think, you have I the options of like saying. dash dash latest, dash dash oldest, or like dash dash compatible with 2015, then that's kind of the really the key stuff that we need to get and then yeah, yeah, we we kind of bike shed on like what the defaults are. Because yeah, I think it probably makes sense to do a default similar to what we were talking about with ZFS create, which was like January of the year you're in. So you know, a brand new feature won't be on by default, but everything sure. that's common will be. Yeah, like we can we can kind of decide what the defaults are based on you know how everybody feels about it and how all the different releases feel and all that stuff. Yeah. But cool. do I understand correctly that uh, if you use the flag and then you stop using the flag, you won't be able to, and you receive the, some of those uh, streams uh, with the flags and with the flag, you won't be able to receive the streams without the flag, correct? The receivable file. Correct. Yeah. Once you start using dash capital L, you need to keep using it. Otherwise, um, on older systems, uh, if the receiving system is old, it will receive it, but might zero out some files that shouldn't be zeroed out. And with newer bits, the receive will fail. Because my concern would be that uh, if people are not using ZFS send to actually uh, put the streams aside, because this is what we were thinking about, that we wanted to send ZFS streams to a file and store them somewhere and just do regular full backup incremental backups and keep them somewhere because if we cannot if we, we cannot rely on a receiving system to actually have zfs and we still need to do backups so that was our our idea but then we would uh, we would learn when we try to restore that we we cannot truly receive those if we will switch those flags right but basically we'll have a stream that that is not receivable and we will learn that somewhere in the future. Yeah, but that, that's true anytime you ZFS send to a file. You, you don't actually know it's re re receivable until you try it. Well, but it should be receivable if it was faithfully of transmitted. Of course, Yeah, it should be, you're right. But you won't actually know until you try it. But this is just is the worst kind of general backup rule of backups. Right? But, is uh, it should work. <laughs> it's almost worse than not having backups is backups that should work, but have never been tested. But that's some general general rule, but uh, uh, yes, I sure would expect- Internet has died. You matter okay? I think he's gone. Yeah. And at an appropriate time, since this is the end of the meeting. <laughs> Shall we just hang around till he comes back? Um, I noticed one thing uh, got knocked off the agenda. Does anybody have an opinion about the compressed arc topic? I didn't. I, I don't have an opinion about it, but I haven't found a use case yet where it isn't a win. 
So uh, single-threaded reads uh, are a lot slower with it. Because they have to decompress? Uh, well, it's mostly because uh, you don't start decompressing until you request each block. Uh, so there's like there's no decompress ahead. So there's no, no pre prefetch pre sort of. The, basically, yeah. the decompression happens from only one thread, yeah. uh, or however many threads you're reading. Like each thread that's doing the reads is doing the decompression versus, you know, back in the old old days, the decompression would happen in the ZIO pipeline in parallel. And so yeah, prefetch would have decompressed blocks into the arc for you a bit ahead. Uh, in general, you know, it, you're still getting gigabytes per second. It's just, you know, in my, the one benchmark I did in the PR, it meant three gigabytes a second instead of eight gigabytes a second, uh, reading from uh, the files fully cached in the arc. Okay, well, that's, that's significant. I mean, well, that was just one benchmark too, though, you know. But. No, I, I, I can totally understand that. That would make me think that being able to disable it is useful because I can certainly, I certainly know people who, who design their working sets to fit in the system RAM it, with the with the understanding that they're doing it for performance. Or maybe a better way of putting that is they design their system RAM to fit their working set. I'm not sure, but but yeah, that's a two and a half x kit. I, I could totally understand those people wanting to shut it off. Although we might be able to fix that. Well, that would be better. Also, um, how much more arc space do you get to use as a result? And what does that do for the total performance? Yeah, like in general, the compressed arc is a huge win. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's I said, just, I, just metadata. Even if you have none of your blocks are compressed, just the metadata that you can cache more of makes. If you only have a 10 gig working set though, say. It's probably going to fit either way, and then it's going to be. Um, feels like I, I, storing I apologize, it. guys. I need oh. to. I need to go to another yep. meeting. Um, Actually, so do I. So uh, I. Um, and I apologize for my internet. I'll try to get my. Uh, I think the problem is my Wi-Fi. I need to get on the wired thing, which I thought I was. I will try to get that fixed for next meeting. Um, next meeting will be four weeks from today at the later time. Uh, thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 -bye.